Hello, you join me inside, exciting, the first Rolls-Royce SUV, 4x4, call it what you will. It's called the Cullinan, and from in here, I have the benefit of not being able to see the outside. Is that harsh? Should we get that out of the way? Rolls-Royce has gone to try and take Rolls-Royce cues and apply them to a car that it has never made before. It's a little bit Canyonero, isn't it, from the outside? But if you like it, look, fair enough, you like it. I think it's an unusual looking car. What is it then? It is Rolls-Royce's first 4x4. It's the first time Rolls-Royce has put four-wheel drive into a car. People have gone and said, look, I like my Rolls-Royce. I like driving it. What I'd really like is a version that I can drive a bit more often. Maybe I could take the family in. Maybe I could stick stuff in the boot, take shooting, take skiing, doing all the kinds of things that people would like to do in an expensive car but nobody has ever thought to give them a really practical, expensive car. They refer to them as high net worth individuals. It's a pretty ghastly phrase, isn't it? But I think the thinking is, just because you earn loads of money, or you have loads of money, you don't necessarily want to spend your every waking hour in a Lamborghini Aventador. You want something practical. So here it is. It is based on Rolls-Royce's latest aluminium architecture, which is bespoke to the brand. That made its debut last year on the new Phantom. This is not quite such a flagship model as the Phantom, it's a bit cheaper. Starts from £250,000. Yeah, that's cheap. Starts from £250,000, so it's a bit less flamboyant than the Phantom, which of course has that big gallery across the dash and mega, mega levels of bespoke personalisation options. The Ghost, the Wraith and the Dawn, they all sit on a slightly different architecture, but they will eventually come onto this bespoke Rolls-Royce platform. So this is the second model on it. It has a 6.75 litre twin turbocharged V12 in the front, and it drives through an eight-speed automatic gearbox to an electronically controlled clutch. Normally, 100% of the power goes to the rear, or up to 100% of the power goes to the rear, but it diverts power forwards when it needs to, up to 50% can go to the front. There are open differentials at the front and rear from the gearbox. The shaft goes to a differential which sits underneath the engine and then puts power to left and right. There are no locking differentials, there's no low ratio like there is in an old school hardcore 4x4. Uh, but what it will do is torque vector by braking, so if one wheel starts spinning on that side, it'll break the other tyre, so it, it'll break that tyre so it doesn't, so power goes the other way, if you like. By all accounts, it is quite capable. I've driven it a bit off-road and it does feel, I think, as capable off-road as people will need it to. There's no hard set formula, is there, for what makes a car great off-road. A Suzuki Jimny will go some places that a Land Rover Discovery won't, but a Discovery will go places that a Jimny won't, and likewise with this. This 570 horsepower V12 makes peak torque from 1600 RPM. So if you're on a sand dune and you want loads of torque really quickly and to keep the wheels spinning and to keep the momentum up, actually, this car's quite good at that. But it also weighs 2700 kilos. 2700 kilos. So there are places it won't go very far because it will just sink, whereas an old Suzuki SJ would just glide over. So anyway, that's the concept. What's it like? Well, it feels beautifully finished in the front here. Uh, it's priced at a bit more than a Bentley Bentayga, quite a bit more than a Range Rover, but those are probably its two closest rivals in ethos and price. In material quality, it's way above where a Range Rover sits. It's probably a little bit above where a Bentley sits. They might be sort of a bit nip and tuck in other places. But the fact that it's got the BMW sourced iDrive system, which is which is brilliant, and these dials are really nice. It, it's, it's a great driving environment, a really nice driving environment. And it's also a very quiet one. I'm doing about 45 miles an hour and can't hear a lot, can you? You can barely hear the engine at any time unless you go full throttle. Tiny bit of wind noise, tiny bit of road noise but really it's very quiet. It's the sort of car that most people will drive themselves, but there is the option of having three seats in the back or two seats in the back. And if you have the individual rear chairs, there is a little glass partition to its easiest. If I hop in the back and tell you what it's like back there. So over to Matthew in the rear. Yes, thank you, Matthew. So welcome to the back of a Cullen and where I get actually quite a lot of legroom. There's only one wheelbase in here, but there is, there is loads of legroom. I got more than a hand worth of headroom. So this is the bench version, so you can seat three across, and they are electrically operated split. Now this is where it gets a bit complex. 
because there is not a flat low floor. Now you might like a flat low floor, but because I sit higher than the people in the front, and these seats are big and big and comfy and everything else, you can't really give a flat low floor. So what there is instead is a sort of electrical ramp in the back so you can push loads through. I think actually it's quite a reasonably practical solution to that thing. You can have two individual chairs, in which case they recline and electrically do all that sort of thing, and they've got like a champagne chiller in the middle. And there is also then a glass partition. So far, the split between sales is about 70% of people are having this rear bench seat because it's much more practical. If you only have the two seats in the rear, you can't put the rear seats down, in which case you might as well not have an SUV. And what's the driving experience like in the front? Well, let's have a listen to that engine. There it is. Sounds nice, sounds smooth. V12s are really smooth. The gear shift is really smooth. I don't get a choice about which gear to be in myself, but if I push a low button here, it kind of holds it in a low gear, usually second if I push the off-road button here, and then if I turn stability control off too, that's when it puts everything in 50-50 four-wheel drive. It raises the body by about 40 millimeters, so it gives you 540 mil of weight depth, which is not bad. Rolls does think a lot of its buyers will use these cars off-road. They'll go ski resorts, they'll go sand tuning, they'll go towing stuff a lot as well. But also, quite a lot of people who spend a quarter of a, or a third of a million pounds on an off-roader live in places with quite a lot of grounds and tracks, so they might well just tool around their own estates as well. But on-road it is where it's supposed to be at, and the ride quality is very, very good. It's running on 22 inch wheels here. 21s or 22s are the options. It's two roll bars at the front, two anti-roll bars at the front, one at the rear. I think they've got this sort of 12 volt, not the, not the 48 volt active anti-roll bar that the Bentley has, which, which applies a lot of torque to resist roll very quickly. These do not resist roll as much. So there is a little bit of roll and float to this car, you know, when you get it when you get it moving. And Rolls has allowed the suspension to breathe. It hasn't tried to, to tie it down. It hasn't tried to be sporty in a way that a Bentayga tries to be sporty. And it is all the better for that, I think. It's smooth, it's relaxed. I mean, it's really relaxed. I think this is the sort of car that you get into, drive 800 miles in a day and get out the other end and feel absolutely fine. It's that, it's that sort of quiet, refined car. And from that point of view, it feels like, cliche coming, the Rolls-Royce of SUVs.